Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering five conversations, one from our season three, episode 20, which was the getting to know you conversation with Jorn Schottenberg, and four from episode 21, which included newsworthy conversations with Naeem al Khoury and Donna Cryer. This conversation has two distinct elements. In the first, Louise Campbell, Naeem al Khoury, and I all discuss how specific cap cutoffs a healthcare professional uses from a fiber scan test relate to the goal of the test, with one threshold to motivate patients to greater self-care, and another higher one for prescribing medication. The second element has Naeem discussing work he is doing with the behavioral diet app Noom and other work with digital therapeutics manufacturers. This evolves into a wider conversation about the role that digital supports, digital apps, and AI might play separately and cumulatively in treatment of the future. It's heady and a little visionary. Enjoy it. One thing we've been blessed with on the Nash Tsunami podcast is brilliant, compelling, and charismatic guests. Jorn has been so fantastic, we invited him to join us every week. Back at the beginning, we invited Donna to join us every week, but her schedule and self-care needs couldn't handle the grind. And I'd love to have Naeem with us a lot more often, but a guy who runs a clinic in Phoenix, another in Cleveland, has headquarters in Tucson, is helping to raise two kids, and goes to conferences around the world, has a pre-packed schedule. It was really powerful to kick around treatment models with Jorn, and equally, if not more so, to learn about some of the exciting work that Naeem and Donna are doing. Every episode is fun, but frankly, recording this set of interviews was near the top of my list. So sit back, listen. Enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. Louise Campbell. My other thought about when Naeem was talking about using the 248 cutoff is that's not dissimilar to what I see when people walk in for lifestyle. But also using that 248 means they've got targets because you use it, we use each of the grades, but they do make it. They do feel better when they get to that level. But it's also about the cardiovascular risk, the hypertension, all of the other risks that we're going long term. So maybe those figures aren't too far out of what we're seeing in background populations. And that's the concern. By looking earlier, you detect that earlier and I think that's obviously where I'm coming from now because we shouldn't get into that level of the two the 305s the pluses the ones with the fibrosis if we've gone downstream or upstream isn't it that to me is more what I see in the general public that come in and they're interested in their liver health but their mental approach is different oh so I've got a little bit of liver fat we share it with the GP we share anything they're always taken that way but it's like oh I've got a little bit of liver fat what can I do now about it there's a total different ability because they've not been diagnosed with the disease that they're focused on they're just being told to tweak something it's more of that self-management and tweak and as you've said for the weekend I've just done three weeks of eating and drinking in Sydney which is not what I would normally do so I'll be doing my liver fat when I get home and I'll be (laughs) tweaking um, uh, slightly more but I have that ability and I know lots of people in the liver world who do that too it's that ability now to be able to look non-invasively you would test somebody's blood pressure for hypertension you might give somebody an ECG this is this should just be that sort of standard let's check it out and rule it out rather than and wait to rule it in. Name al I mean, I couldn't agree more. The way I think about it, Louise, is let's rule it out when the intervention is lifestyle. When someone is obese, they have insulin resistance. We have nothing to lose. We can work with them to lose weight that will add years to their lifespan. And uh, there's really no downside to eating healthy and being more active. I think we need to think about ruling and being more confident that there is significant disease when we think about pharmacologic treatment, especially with medicines that may have potential for side effects. So this is how I look at it. If my recommendation is going to be lifestyle, I'm going to be very aggressive and use the local. If I'm thinking about studying medicine, probably I'm going to do the fiber scan, follow it with another non-invasive test, make sure that I'm treating real disease, and then get them on pharmacologic treatment. You know, it's funny you should mention that. I'm, I'm, I'm living with this right now, not liver disease, but uh, I white coat my uh, blood pressure readings. So I got a home machine. I'm not taking my uh, pressure twice a day, and I am consistently prehypertensive. You know, I'm not, I'm not not, I'm not anywhere near 140 over 90, but I'm not below 120 over 80 regularly either. And it's motivating me to drop a few pounds and change the weight because I really don't want to go on medication. And the ACEs and the ARBs are generally pretty benign drugs, but if I don't need to take a medication, why would I do that, right? So I think that's exactly the phenomenon you're talking about. The low cutoff will motivate better behavior. The high cutoff is what drives you to medicate or not. Makes sense. Yeah, 
Yeah, speaking of lifestyle, so I'm very excited to share that we've been working with Noom, the weight loss app. We actually are doing an investigator-initiated study. It's a single center study done at Arizona Liver Health in uh, Phoenix, where we actually enrolled 40 uh, subjects with obesity and evidence of fatty liver disease on FibroScan. And they're going to get the Noom app, and we're going to follow them for a period of uh, six months. And we'll see how much weight they lose at the end. This will be the primary endpoint. But then we're looking at multiple secondary endpoints including reduction in liver fat on the cap score improvement in liver stiffness measurements changes in alt ast and then some investigational biomarkers that will look at hepatocyte apoptosis and liver fibrosis so you know i love writing protocols i like to do investigator initiated studies i like to kind of be in charge of a few things that we do locally because this is exciting you feel like this is your baby you worked on it with the sponsor you enrolled the patients we've seen some good results already but we need to look at the full data set at the end but it seems like you know when people commit to noom they actually lose weight and we've seen a remarkable reduction in liver fat in some patients and i cannot share the results of this study hopefully by the end of this year we should be done with data analysis we're also getting more and more involved in the field of digital therapeutics uh, so these are you know apps that eventually will receive fda approval and they will need medical provider to prescribe to patients and they rely on game theory and gaming to engage patients to lose weight so we just launched a new study also with better therapeutics and we're going to enroll 20 patients and for this study they will receive a liver mri to quantify liver fat on mri pdff and will assess changes after the intervention so i think this is you know we always talk about lifestyle interventions diet and exercise we always talk about pharmacologic treatment but i see this as a kind of a companion to pharmacologic treatments to improve the effect of lifestyle interventions and I think we're going to hear more and more about these digital therapeutics and weight loss apps in the years to come. So you made the comment that Noom relies on motivated patients. Do digital therapeutics rely on them to the same degree or is it your belief that it will be easier to get sicker people? I mean, go back to where we started, right? You've got the low end, you've got the marker that says you want to motivate people to do better. High end, you've got drugs. We would take a diet behavioral intervention like Noom maybe all the way through that scale from 240 to 303 as an analogy. Where do the digital therapeutics kick in? Digital therapeutics, they're relying heavily on cognitive behavioral therapy and educating the patients about the relationship with food and why we overeat and what are the drivers behind what we sometimes perceive as lack of will to lose weight, which is really way more complicated than the individual will to to actually uh, implement the lifestyle changes. I think they also rely heavily on plant-based recipes and providing the patients with easy-to-make plant-based foods. And I think also the involvement of this gaming and achieving different levels. I think at the end of the day, we will need to generate data similar to what we generate in pharma-sponsored trials. So we're starting with these proof-of-concept studies, but eventually it will be a biopsy, potentially a biopsy. We'll see, depending on the timing, I'm always saying that we need to get rid of biopsy. So I hope we don't get to biopsy trials with digital therapeutics, but it's going to be whatever the FDA will allow as a provable endpoint for clinical trial that we use in pharma trials that we have to achieve with these digital therapeutics before they get FDA approval. So a lot that we need to do and we have a steep learning curve to see what works, what doesn't work. We have ways to measure patient uh, engagement also and we may end up at a point where we do some surveys and initial assessment before we prescribe a specific digital therapeutic if we have different options to select the most appropriate patient for the most appropriate app. I'm kind of wowed, frankly. I'm in Envisioning, first of all, your idea that goes, we might do surveys to figure out which digital app gets to, goes to which patient is, I think, a rather um, exceptional level of being able to engineer digital apps to specific behaviors and then identify which behaviors they match up with, which is really cool. It takes me back to one of the things that's come up on this podcast a few times recently, which is, and, and Louise mentioned this, in fact, Naeem, this is the thing Louise mentioned last week that you got so excited about. Can we use patient intake interviews to do AI assessments on who's likely to have fatty liver issues, right? Over time, before you get to pharmacology, with good AI and good digital tools, there's just an awful lot you can do. It's an exciting world. It is. And I think, you know, the other thing we need to get to is that, uh, you know, diet interventions and counseling should be personalized. This should be based on the genome, microbiome, exposome, family history. What we are doing is, you know, I mean, everyone has an opinion about what diet is best, but really there's no one diet that works for everyone. And when I say that, I mean, it's not just your preference and what 
what you like to eat, but it's really your microbiota, your genome, how you metabolize different things. And we're not there yet, but I was encouraged this past week. I had two patients come to me with 23andMe and another company that does genome sequencing. And they show you very interesting data on the risk of hemochromatosis and alpha-1 antitrypsin. And these are cheap tests that, you know, I mean, you can do for $200 now. And I think we're going to get to the same level with the microbiome. And it's going to be interesting to implement all of this with the patient quality of life questionnaires and their preference to really develop a personalized diet, lifestyle intervention, and potentially an app that works for them. To me, it's a no-brainer. I think a lot of people use the digital technology anyway. My mother was as hypoten- pulmonary hypertension and was told by her hospital physician, use the digital apps that do your oxygen levels, things like that. They're not ideal. They're not clinically, they're not even medically approved, but they help doctors track and they help motivate patients and they keep them reassured. I think that's a real benefit. Is there a potential in the future to say that most illnesses that are lifestyle we could prevent if you're given the app, if you're allowed to use these technologies? What we're seeing at the moment is the rise in these diseases. Are these individuals who don't really engage with the apps or don't want to see that data because it becomes frightening. There's that mix. Some people enjoy that type of monitoring. Some people get an engage. I enjoy watching my sleep score. I don't get a lot of that in Australia with you guys, but um, it's other people want to know every morsel they've eaten, where their energy, track their energy, do, do that. And I think it's where body shape doesn't matter so much when you're looking at that digital app. So, But some people feel embarrassed wearing those, the watches. They're difficult if you take them off your wrists and things like that. So I'm excited to see where it's going and how we can engage the groups that use it less to use it more without feeling that they're being tracked too much. So like uh, Naya at the beginning, at the top of the episode, you have a couple of bad days, then you go back to a couple of good days. <laughs> yeah. I think, Louise, is part of the answer to your question is going to wind up lying exactly where Naeem was, which is behavioral health, which is, you know, different people may be willing to deal with different levels of digital intervention. And if they trust the sanctity of their data, then a lot of this is set up by game theory and to figure out what it is that motivates people. So if we get the motivation right, eventually there'll be a broad enough menu that more people will be able to choose something that works for them. Never everybody. I don't think that's feasible. I think you're still going to have a lot of people who aren't going to touch it. But the more people we can help, right? The better. So, Naeem, this is quite a bunch of stuff you brought us. Anything else you want to share so far? Um, I think this is fantastic. Uh, well, no, thank you so much for having me. I think I've, I've said enough for one episode. There's always so much happening in our world, and in addition to the papers and the trials, there's a lot that's happening in the educational sphere also, and we're trying to raise awareness, and this is something we should uh, maybe discuss in one of the episodes and see what we can do to elevate it and bring it to more providers, especially mid-levels, you know, MP physician assistants or advanced practice practitioners but there's a lot of work to be done a lot of education that we need to do and now back to roger we hope you've enjoyed this recording if you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or either of the episodes please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com we'll be back next week with our preview of the fifth global nash congress taking place in london at the end of may until then stay safe surf on and we'll see you on the podcast bye-bye now